I'm not sure whether I can start <laughs> without the approval by some of the organizers. You have my approval. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> then let me start my third ah third <laughs> lecture. So I guess it's okay to start. Um, originally, I was thinking of devoting the third and the fourth lectures of mine to the discussion of the anomalies of finite groups in low dimensions, but it appears that Max Metlitsky talked a lot about it in his third and the fourth lectures by looking at, looking at the videos. So um, I, I will talk about the anomalies of finite groups from my perspective uh, later, but I decided to spend a bit more of my talk to the discussion of the anomalies of the fermions. So let me continue the point where I stopped yesterday. So yesterday, we discussed the anomaly cancellations of the heteriotic string uh, from the following point of view. Uh, so we considered E8 times E8 were heteriotic supergravity or superstring theory. And we noted that the anomaly polynomials cancel, can be made to cancel between the fermions and the B field, right? So very briefly, anomaly polynomial of fermions had the form 2 pi i integral of over some 12 dimensional uh, auxiliary manifolds and some four form first E8 and the second E8 and the gravity contribution divided by 2 and there's a big bracket and uh, complicated degree H term. So that's the fermions anomaly. And we learned yesterday that uh, B field, a two-form gauge field in 10 dimensions, has a mixed anomaly between its higher form symmetry, uh, which is given schematically of this form. So the background field for the two-form symmetry is x3, and the background field for the six-form symmetry, six-form one, u1 one symmetry, is this y. Right? So we can make them to cancel by declaring that this part is given by this, and uh, the other part, this Z8, is this background for the sixth form, uh, U1 symmetry. So this is the standard anomaly cancellation, Green-Schwartz anomaly cancellation for the heterotic strings, E80 times E8 heterotic strings, uh, in the following sense. So let me remind you that, uh, yes? Is there a reason you don't mention SO32? Uh, um, yes. Uh, so the question was why I wasn't mentioning SO32. Uh, so up to this point, SO32, or more precisely spin 32 over Z2, <laughs> works exactly the same way. But what I'm going to talk from now doesn't work uh, as, I state, as I will state. Uh, from various reasons. I will comment on that because you asked, asked me about that. Um, so le let me remind you what was this anomaly polynomial, right? So why do we need this 12-dimensional thing, which is very high dimensional? The physical space-time of strings is 10-dimensional. So the problem was that apparently, I mean, before this cancellation, you don't know whether there is an anomaly or not. So to describe the anomaly, uh, one way we learned is to consider a uh, 11 dimensional auxiliary uh, space 
so that at least the value of the partition function of the combined system makes sense, right? But then, well, I already wrote this figure so many times, but the ratio of these two is some function. Uh, I mean, it's the partition function of the anomaly, 11-dimensional anomaly theory evaluated on this 11-dimensional space obtained by combining one W11 and another W11 prime with this orientation reversed. And uh, so now I switch the notation slightly and just refer to this entire 11-dimensional closed manifold as W11. And what this tells you is that uh, you further extend W11 to U12. In this case, if, if there is such a U12, um, you say that uh, this ZA of W11 is given by exponential of 2 pi i U12 of this anomaly polynomial. I mean, that's the definition of the anomaly polynomial of a general QFT. And I just told you that these things vanish, right? Therefore, this is 1. When there is this U12 to which, so for, for this U12, you need, to you need to do the following. So originally, we are th considering a theory with fermions, right? So on this Y10, you have spin structure, and you have E8 times E8, and uh, Right, so both spin structure and E8 times E8 needs to be extended into W11. And you need to find a U12 where you can find such spin structure and E8 times E8. So, so far so good, but uh, we are learning more and we understand things slightly better than in the past, right? So we know that there can be cases where you don't have, you might not have such 12-dimensional manifold, right? We encountered such an example before in the case of uh, the anomaly of two-dimensional Majorana fermion when the left mover is uncharged under Z2 and the right mover is charged under Z2. In that case, um, for a particular case of S3 over Z2 with non-trivial Z2, there's no such U2, U4 in that case. So. Um, you might worry that the heterotic string, in fact, suffers from such a global anomaly, right? So you need to worry about that. So this is a good place to uh, remind ourselves how to capture these global anomalies, uh, which we discussed in the last lecture. So let's remind ourselves how we proceed. So let's assume that we already uh, know that the anomaly polynomial cancels. So what happens in that case? So there are cases where this W11 doesn't have a U12 where you don't have any other boundary. But uh, it can happen, but that you can still you can still connect to different 11-dimensional uh, manifolds. So this, the, so I just draw the case where this is disjoint, but uh, you call this entire thing as W11 prime. And uh, you can show exactly by the same argument that the anomaly theory, this partition function, on W11 is equal to the anomaly theory partition function on this W11 prime because the general uh, machinery tells you that the difference is given by the integral of this anomaly polynomial <coughs> over this U12. But I just told you, we just learned that this vanishes, so they are equal, right? But again, the important thing is that you need to have spin structure and also E8 gauge field in the bulk, right? So mathematically, this means that 
This means that ZA defines a homomorphism from something called the omega spin uh, 11 with B8 times B8 and to U1. So this is a complicated symbol, but it doesn't mean anything more than what I already said. So you consider all 11 dimensional manifolds, right, with spin structure assigned to it together with two E8 bundles. And you are supposed to extend that. I mean, if you can find a U12 which has this spin structure and the two E8 bundles such that they are connected, they, then they are considered equal. And because of this relation, this partition function of the anomaly theory uh, def defines a homomorphism from this to that. So in order to characterize the anomaly, possible global anomaly of the heteriotic supergravity, you need to understand that, right? Now, I wasn't perfectly correct when I say that. In fact, the things slightly simplify because of this coupling. So because of this coupling that, uh, that a certain combi I mean, this degree four term is equal to this uh, background field for the higher form symmetry of the anomaly poly uh, for, of the B field uh, means that this, that means in a standard more traditional language that the Bianchi identity of the B field, so this H is DB, right? And Bianchi identity of DH equals instanton number of E8, so E81 plus instanton number of E82 minus P1 metric over 2, right? So this means that because this is a uh, co the extra derivative of a globally well-defined ob object, this means that um, this is homologically trivial, right? So this means that if you give the metric and a single E8, the second E8 is essentially determined. So there's no topological content in this uh, second E8. So it is known that you can, in fact, drop this second E8 because it doesn't give you any additional topological information. So what you need to ch check that to, 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 to find whether global anomaly exists for heteriotic supergravity or not is to understand this homomorphism, right? And so you might worry that this might be a difficult question, and indeed it is a difficult question, but it is known that this group, this group happens to be trivial. So this is trivial, known to be. So just because of that, there cannot be any possible global anomaly. So this way, you can say that uh, heterotic E8 times E8 heterotic supergravity is free of global anomaly. Um, so now I can answer the question why I didn't mention SO32. Um, if you use SO32 or spin 32 over Z2, you need to use uh, SO spin 32 over Z2 and this group doesn't vanish. And uh, yeah, so then it's extremely more, it's infinitely more subtle. And honestly speaking, I don't understand the vanishing of the global anomaly for the spin 32 of Z2 case. There's a complicated paper by Dan Fried, and which I didn't understand. Yes? Um, why is this, do we know why this is Ah, uh, the question is why this, is, this vanishes, right? Um, I don't know. Um, there's a math paper, and I can follow the computation but that's very difficult, and I, I don't have any physics understanding of that. But let me make a comment on the history. Um, you might wonder exactly when this analysis was done, right? Uh, uh, this was done in, well, 
I, I guess you guys are young, so I, you, I need to re remind you that original Green Schwartz cancellation was found in 84, right? This was done in 86 already. I mean, just two years after that. Uh, it was, of course, done by Witten. And <laughs> <laughs> it's in a paper called the topologi Some Topological Tools in Ten Dimensions. Very modest title. <laughs> and it's not uh, one of the very well cited papers of Witten. It only has 30 something citations I just checked before I came here. But it's an amazing paper. I mean, he already understood that the global anomaly is in general characterized by the cobaltism group, right, in one higher dimension <laughs> with this structure. And uh, I guess so he came up to this point just by himself, right? And I guess he had exactly the same question like you. How would you, how would you know that this vanishes, right? But he had, I, I think he asked a mathematician to compute. In fact, that physics paper has an appendix by an algebraic topologist, Stong, who is one of the, I mean, very well-known algebraic topologists, I should say. And he computed this group for Edward, where it was shown to, to vanish. So, so far, so good. I mean, the global anomaly of hedge strings doesn't exist. So that's how it worked. Um, yeah. Your statement for spin 32 mod Z2 is that the corresponding group <laughs> does not vanish, yet nonetheless there is no global anomaly. Uh, the, question was, yeah, yeah, the question was, what happens in the case of uh, spin 32 over Z2? Um, my understanding, uh, trying to understand what Danfried says is that uh, if you replace, replace E8 by SO32 over, uh, sorry, spin 32 over Z2, um, this group doesn't vanish and the global anomaly doesn't vanish either. You need to consider a rather strange combination of the space-time spin structure and the uh, uh, group, uh, I mean, gauge group SO spin 32 over Z2. But the, we believe that there are string theories. Ah, yes, 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 Z2, yes, so yes. still, it works out in some Yeah, in, in the end, it works out. In the end, it works out. Yeah, but Fried says that you need to use K-theory versions of all of the analysis, but yeah. I, I haven't followed it carefully, so. But, but string theory exists. I mean, you have T duality, so definitely the <laughs> anomaly, global anomaly should vanish, but checking it using this uh, technique is very complicated for the SO32 heteristic string. Yes. Yes, please. So, the for general T is very complicated. Right. So, like, what does BE8 look like? BE8? Yeah. Ah, so one good thing about BE8, which is used both by Witten and, uh, Witten and uh, Stong, is that it's very simple. I mean, E8 is, in fact, the simplest possible uh, group as far as the topology is concerned. So you can have a look at the list of hom homotopy groups of various Lie groups, and E8 is extremely simple. I mean, it has pi three, of course, to account for the instantons, and then there are lots of zeros up to pi 13 or something, if I remember correctly. So because pi pi's are just absent, um, the computation for this thing is becomes extremely simple, and that's why it's useful. Yeah. In fact, uh, you can ask similar questions for the global anomaly cancellation for the M theory, right? Um, so you need to ask what would be the anomalies carried by the gravitino in M theory and also the three form C field in M theory, right? And uh, in fact, it's very difficult to check that the anomalies vanish. And the easiest way I know to show how it vanishes is to rewrite the M theory three form C as the Chan Simons invariant, Chan Simons form of an auxiliary E8 gauge field. And then you use the property of the E8 gauge group to analyze the anomaly. That's what's like done by uh, Diaconescu and Moore and Witten. And uh, yeah, so that, so somehow, well, these are a bit technical, but somehow it's useful. Any more questions? 
Right. Um, so let me discuss another example of anomaly cancellation from a recent paper of mine. Um, so let's discuss type 1 or heteriotic SO32. So let's discuss type 1 SO32. Right, one way to say, say the structure of the type 1 theory is that it has O9 minus plane together with 16 D9 planes. Right? So this means that O9 plane has D9 charge minus 16 to cancel the positive D9 charge of the 16 D9 brains. And by using T dualities, you can compute the charges of other oriented folds. So O8 plane has D8 charge minus 8, because when you T dualize a uh, 9 brain, you get two oriented fold 8 planes at the fixed points of the oriented fold in action, right? So it's very easy to continue this process, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. And then correspondingly, the charge is minus 4, minus 2, minus 1, minus a half, minus 1 quarter, dot, dot, dot. And you immediately wonder, I mean, I suppose you, uh, many of you learned the basics of string theory. And one of the important things is that the uh, D brains, charges of the D brains satisfy the Dirac quantization law. So that requires you to have integer charges for everything, right? So up to this point, it's OK. But now, orientifold 4 plane has 1 half as the charge, and orientifold 3 plane has minus a quarter as the charge. So the Dirac quantization is violated. Therefore, the string theory is inconsistent. So we can go home right now, right? I mean, it's inconsistent. Um, so this bothered me uh, for a long time, since when I first studied string theory using Polchinski's textbooks. Apparently, not many people cared. I don't know why. I mean, this is clearly wrong. But there's an answer, at least, uh, for O4 minus, uh, which, was, which can be found already in paper by Witten in 1907. So it's, uh, but uh, for, for O3, nobody knew, and uh, we recently figured out how. And that can be understood just by combining what I told you already in the first two lectures. So uh, I'd, li I, I'd like to tell you that. So let's remind ourselves how the Dirac quantization can be understood in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of this anomaly, right? So let's say you have a D-brain, and it has a coupling to the RR field. So the world volume is Q plus 1 dimensional. So this is, a D, this is for DQ brain, DQ brain. So how do we make sense of it, right? So how the, the way you make sense of it is to extend y to w and y to w prime in two different ways. And uh, the ratio is given by exponential I mean, of 2 pi i. 2 pi i integral over this combined uh, w and minus w prime over f, sorry, over 2 pi, right? So if the flux is quantized, this is 1. Therefore, there's no anomaly. So that's what happens to this point, right? But 
what these values mean is that this w is the surrounding space of the orientifold. Uh, this can provide, I mean, minus 1 can be minus 1, minus 1 for all 4, or all 4 minus, and can be i, I mean, for all 3 minus, right? So it's inconsistent. If this is the only contribution to this type of analysis in, in the string theory. But thankfully, that's not the case. Uh, the superstring and the brains within it have a lot of other fields. So let's discuss the case of all four. So let's say you can you have some all four plane, right? And uh, you consider the surrounding space around all four, which turns out to be S four over Z two, if you think carefully. So this is W, right? And uh, so you are considering world volume y, y3, I guess, of d2 brain embedded here. But you need to remember that d2 brain has n equals 8 Susie in 3D, right? And uh, we don't need any Susie, but you need to know that there are 8. Susie. This means that there are eight fermions. There are eight fermions on it. So this means that when you analyze this type of things, you need to consider the anomaly of the fermions, anomalies of the eight fermions associated to this space. Right? So as I told you, what you need to study is the eta invariant in the space of S4 over Z, Z2. And this is for single fermion. Single fermion, right? And you need to take the eighth power to, because there are eight copies of fermions, because you have a, n equals eight Susie. So this is the anomalous phase associated to the fermion, right? And, uh, and uh, it so happens that this single fermion contributes exponential 2 pi i over 16. So we've seen yesterday that for 2D fermions, the similar thing give, gave you 2 pi i over 8. In, in the, for the 3D fermion, you get 2 pi i over 16. So if you take the eighth power, you get minus 1. So it nicely cancels this annoying phase coming from this minus a half, I mean, which gives the exponential 2 pi i a half, right? So that's how it goes. Ah, and uh, it works for both O4 plus and O4 minus, because O4 minus has charge charge minus half, and O4 plus gives you charge plus a half. So bo in both cases, you just get minus 1, and they cancel. And then we can discuss O3. O3 minus, O3 plus minus, right? So it's similar. So you consider a surrounding space around O3, which happened to be S5 over Z2. So this is W. 
and you are considering uh, y4, which is uh, on, on which you have d3 brain, and you know that d3 brain has n equals 4, so z, in four dimensions, which means that you have four fermions. <laughs> right? So what you need to compute is exponential of 2 pi i, eta invariant of S5 over Z2 for the single fermion. And you need to take the fourth power, right? And as I told you, this thing can be explicitly computed because you know the Dirac spectrum. And this, again, turns out to be 1 16th. And be, because you take just fourth power instead of the eighth power, you get exponential of 2 pi i over 1 quarter. So this nicely cancels uh, this value. Or so I thought last year. And that's what's written in the paper from last year. But in fact, that's not quite correct. Um, anyway, uh, so that, yes? I think you explain this, but you wrote O3 plus or minus, and the, yeah. the one quarter seems to only cancel with the minus. That's right. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So, so if you are into string theory, you know that there are, in fact, four versions of all three planes, all three minus, all three minus twiddle, all three plus, all three plus twiddle. And uh, people have <coughs> computed the RR charges. And this has minus one quarter. And this is one plus one quarter. And this is one plus one quarter. And this is plus one quarter. And uh, if you work out the sign conventions very carefully, you find that the fermion cancels the anomaly for these. So these, these anomaly, these are canceled by fermions. So far, so good. But uh, in this case, in this particular case, what we have is that you have this original exponential of 2 pi over 4 minus coming from the RR charge. And uh, exactly the same thing coming from the fermions. You, so you still have minus 1 you need to account for. And uh, that's, in fact, accounted for thanks to the anomaly of the Maxwell theory. So in string theory, D brains has Maxwell fields on it. So on the D3, D3 has a Maxwell field. Maxwell field A, right? And uh, Yesterday, I said that Maxwell field has both electric and magnetic U1 symmetry. And you can introduce the background field B2 and C2 for the electric and magnetic one form symmetries. And uh, there's a mixed anomaly characterized by, say, 2 pi i, 2 pi over b2, uh, d, so c2, 2 pi, right? And, uh, and in the string theory, these background fields, b2 and c2, can be directly identified with the NSNS B field and RRC field. And uh, it is known that these four cases have different values of these B field and C field. 
So you need to, in fact, take into account the contribution from this to the anomaly of the Maxwell field. So what happens is that for, so basically there are three choices. I mean, there are four choices of B and Cs. There are four choices of B and Cs in basically 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Because uh, th these are, in fact, torsion, and you can take only Z2 valued. So for the first three cases, you don't get any anomaly because it's just basically B times C. And in the last case, B times C gives you uh, one mod Z2, so you raise it to the power. So, that, so this Maxwell anomaly provides you nothing for these three and provides an additional minus one here. So everything is canceled. So everything works. So that's how it works in the case of uh, O3. Um, honestly speaking, I don't understand what happens for O2 and O1. Um, quotient, I mean, the, it becomes 1 eighth and 1 sixteenth, and things are getting more and more complicated. But I, I believe that string theory works. <laughs> so <laughs> it's similar to my comment to the situation of the global anomaly of the heterotic SO32. I mean, it's difficult to co check. It, it becomes increasing, I mean, more and more difficult to check if there's no anomaly. But uh, I believe that if you spend enough time, uh, you can convince yourself that the anomaly vanishes. So that's, that's, that's how it worked. Yes? And if you look at, at higher orientable planes, you just find that the fermions give no anomalous contribution and there's nothing here to cancel? That's right. Yeah, so the question was, uh, what was the case for these uh, things, right? So originally, we, w we said that because they don't give anomalies, just if you consider that just the R alphas, it should be OK. But after analyzing these things, that argument wasn't, in fact, quite correct. Because you, in, in, in principle, you should have cared also of the anomalies coming f of the world volume field of the Lebrens there. But, but they vanish. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's reassuring. Um, yeah. Ah, so I can comment on a similar issue. Um, in type 2p supergravity, um, you know that, uh, well, this is a chiral, op chiral theory in 10 dimensions, right? But the anomaly, anomaly polynomial for the fermion, this is, this has a non-trivial cancellation between the gravitino and the F5, uh, which is a self-dual field in type 2b, and it, it, it gives zero, right? That's what people say. But that's, that's not entirely true, even at the level of anomaly polynomial. I'm not going to talk about global anomaly. This is because F5 is a self-dual field, but it has uh, the Bianchi identity, which is given by H3 wedge G3, right? Here H3 is the RR, I mean, this is the field strength for the B, and this is the field strength for the C. And uh, you see, this is a background field for the uh, four-form U1 symmetry for this F5, right? And uh, because F5 is a self-dual field, in the anomaly polynomial of this F5 theory, anomaly polynomial, so for, in general, if you have a field, self-dual field F5 with this Bianchi identity, this gives you the anomaly polynomial X6 squared. And you need to multiply by one half because it's a self-real field, but you need to be worried about this, right? And uh, this is non-zero. So is it OK? Is, it, is the total anomaly polynomial still vanish? Well, thankfully, it vanishes, because if you square this, I mean, H3, <laughs> G3, and H3 
and G3. Um, because it's a product of two three forms, if you reorder them, this is zero because it's a square of uh, odd dimensional odd degree forms. So it's okay, but uh, this is some some piece of uh, anomaly cancellation. It's miss which is missing from the standard description in the literature. But uh, so things work. I mean, if you work more and more carefully. Uh, you find more and more worrisome things, but uh, somehow eventually they cancel in string theory. So it seems I, like you're saying every time we found anomaly cancellation in the past, we were just lucky. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm some effect we didn't think about didn't matter. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were lucky, or our string theory is magical. I don't know which way <laughs> is a better way to phrase it. So uh, that's about the anomaly can subtle anomaly cancellations in string theory. So do you have any additional questions about it? I'm, I'm going to start talking about finite groups. Are you happy with that? OK. So let us switch gears. And I'm going to quickly review what Max told you last week. So it might be mostly a repeat, but uh, it wouldn't be too bad to listen to it a couple of times. But I can be quick. Uh, so I no longer keep track of the number of exam the numbering for the examples, but I guess it is example four. So anomalies of finite groups, finite group symmetry in 0 plus 1d. And uh, Nati also talked about this in the lecture in the morning. So let's say, so this, this is just quantum mechanics, right? And let's say the group you are considering is G. Then G would act on the Hilbert space of states on the quantum mechanics. But uh, so, so for each element G in G, there's a linear map, rho G, acting on H. But as Wigner noticed in 1931, <laughs> or maybe even before that, I think I'm referring to that year when his famous textbook was published, and so surely the fact was already known long before that. But uh, group law doesn't have to be satisfied on the nose. You are allowed to have some additional phase factor, alpha gh is in u1. So this is called a projective representation. And it's equi equivalent to having an anomalous symmetry in 0 plus 1 dimensions. So a pictorial way of writing it pictorial way of writing it is that uh, you have a 0 plus 1 dimension of space-time and you act on the system by some symmetry operation and you try to combine them but you have some additional phase factor so I'm just writing the same thing in the pictorial way and uh, I'm sure Max to told you that If you rewrite this thing into rho GHK in, in two different ways, right? You, you can first combine it and then combine the rest. Or you can first combine the last two and then combine with the rest. And that these two uh, procedures give you two dif different ways of uh, different ways of producing alphas. So you get 
the important equation alpha g h k alpha h k which is alpha g h alpha g h k right so this is the e important equation which needs to be satisfied by these uh, phases and you learned from max that this is in fact a cocycle condition of the something called group cohomology and he uh, explained it in detail using both homogeneous cochains and inhomogeneous cochains in the lectures I'm not going to repeat it so what you naturally have in this way of writing is the homogeneous cochain so right uh, where's the eraser so now we would like to understand how this anomaly is cancelled by coupling it to the bulk So here you have 0 plus 1D system uh, with G symmetry, but with an anomaly characterized by alpha, right? And then you attach a certain bulk theory, which cancels the anomaly, the boundary anomaly for you. And Max also told you what is this theory. And this is a, an ungaged version, ungaged digraph written theory. Theory. And uh, again, he gave, a, 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 as far as I saw on the videos, he gave a very detailed uh, discussion of how to. Uh, construct these things so I'm not going to be very detailed but uh, let me discuss things using a dual picture of what he used uh, he used triangulations but let me use defect lines uh, and the defect lines also appeared in the lectures by Xi Yin right so and I think Xi Yin also told you a, a bit about this cohomologies but anyway so let's for a while discuss what happens in the bulk. So in the bulk, you also have G symmetry, right? And uh, G symmetry in the bulk, in particular for finite G symmetry, can be represented by having a line in the bulk uh, such that if you cross it, you experience the group operation G, right? So you imagine living in this two-dimensional world, and there's some wall in that two-dimensional space-time, and if you cross that wall to the other side, you suddenly get transformed by G, right? then then these wall can merge or these wall can separate uh, so if this wall is labeled by H and this is a uh, this is G and H this is GH and if this is GH, this can split into G and H. So the, so the ungaged digraph written theory associates a factor. So you associate a factor alpha GH to such a junction. And you associate a factor alpha GH inverse <coughs> to such a junction. 
Yes, please. So if, if you have like code these lines, the JPEG lines, and if you cross them, do you still assume that like you experience some projection? Uh, no. Um, here, uh, the question was whether the action is still projective or not yeah. in the bulk. Um, so the important thing in this uh, anomaly business and its interpretation as a, using one-dimensional higher theory is that you have an anomalous theory on the boundary, but you have non-anomalous theory in the bulk. So you trade this anomaly by having one-dimensional uh, in addition. If you still have an anomaly, you didn't get much. <laughs> you just complicated the matter, right? So thank you, thank you for the question. So for example, uh, let me just give you an explicit example. Ah, but in, in this way of writing, this consistency condition arises as follows. So again, this already appeared in Sheehan's lecture, and in a dual form appeared, I think, in Max's lecture. So if you have three walls labeled by G and H and K, you can merge it in two different orders, right? And our rule says that you assign alpha, some alpha here and some alpha there, some alpha here and some alpha there. And if you write down this assigning rule to this side on the other side, you exactly reproduce this relation. So, but this might be still a bit abstract. So let me give you the partition function of uh, partition function of a simple 2D theory on a torus. So let's consider a torus. And uh, let's say you put the G background such that if you go around here, you experience G. And if you go around in a different direction, if you go around it vertically, you experience H. So what would be the partition function of the bulk theory in this case? So in order to get the partition function of the bulk theory using this rule, you need to express this particular gauge configuration using the junctions, which isn't too hard. And uh, it's tempting to write junctions here, but it would be very confusing. So let me just write another figures. So let me try to be, yeah, this is, this is something like this. So this point and this point is identified. And you assign lines like this, right? And uh, you assign label G, H, G, H, and G. And sorry, this is H. H and this is G. And this happens to be GH is equal to HG. I mean, these two cycles are commut, commute with a homotopy group. So in particular, HG is uh, equal to GH. Oh, yeah, right? So this is the junction you have. So the rule is that to, uh, you assign a factor of alpha GH in this combining junction and you assign an inverse of this factor for the separating junctions. So you assign one factor here and one, assign one factor there. So this is Z. So I should have written this here. So yes, please. It doesn't seem like where it goes off the top is where it comes back on the bottom. Is it I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very sorry about this. Uh, the question is, is if this figure is correct, which uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Uh, th this is identified with this. The this. Same on the side. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry about this. Yeah. Right. It almost looked like it was a climb bound. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So, so this point is identified by this, and this point is identified by that. Right. So, so for more general surfaces, it's more complicated, but it's not too complicated. So how does this help in canceling the anomaly? 
Again, this is only discussed by Max, but uh, let me describe it using the junctions. So you have this 0, zero plus 1D boundary, right? And uh, you have G and H inserted. But now we have a bulk. Now we have a bulk. So this insertion is connected to need to be connected to the defect wall within. So something, it needs to be something like this. Again, you have 0D boundary. But now you merge the two defect operators on the boundary. Therefore, oops, it had a terrible sound. <laughs> now the defect wall just continues to the interior, right? So our rule is that they translate to the action of the respective uh, linear operator on the on the Hilbert space, but because of the relations I wrote there, this gives you an additional factor of alpha gh, right? So that's appearing here. So that doesn't appear on the boundary, but thanks to this rule, that appears at this vertex. So this vertex provides you alpha gh. So thanks to this, uh, the value of the configuration here and the value of the configuration there are the same. So the boundary can anomaly is cancelled by the bulk. Uh, so there's a certain significance of this in string theory, or in gen more in general, to the uh, gauge theory. So suppose Suppose there's a theory, sorry, suppose there's a 2D theory Q, which is G symmetric, non anomalous, right? But then you can consider the, this. Or be followed by G. I mean, this is G gauge theory. I mean, g g g gauge G. So you can do that. And in particular, the gauge theory or the orbifold on T2 has the partition function that it's given by summing over all torus partition functions with. Uh, the various gauge backgrounds, G and H, right? So this is the formula. But this is not the only possibility. Um, you can also consider first multiplying this 2D theory by ungaged digraph written theory specified by alpha. And then you can gauge the entire setup. So that's what you do. And this thing has its partition function, the torus, uh, like this. So you just have basically the same thing. Uh, basically the same thing. But you need to include the partition function of this side, too, right? And the partition function of that side I just computed to be alpha gh over alpha hg. So you need to include that factor. So you include alpha gh over alpha hg. So this means that when you orbifold by g, or if you take the gate, if you ga gauge by g, there are various choices. I mean, you can just perform the sum, but you can also include this phase. So traditionally, this phase is known as the discrete torsion. And it appeared, as far as I, 
I know in the published form, originally by Wafa in the 86. And uh, so including this gives you uh, more varieties. And one immediate consequence in string theory is that, well, so in string theory, you use two-dimensional theories as the world sheet theory, right? And you can include some boundaries, 0 plus 1 d boundary. And you have some orbifold theory. But let's say you include some discrete torsion specified by alpha. So when you do that, just by what I told you, this boundary, boundary, boundary degrees of freedom, which corresponds to brains, uh, transform in a projective representation of G specified uh, specified by by alpha, right? This is a completely standard result, obvious result from our point of view, but this needed to be found rather independently by Douglas in 98. So it took a long time to realize that this discrete torsion phase leads to brains having a projective representation. Um, and I still have 10 minutes, right? So far, I only talked about anomalies of a finite group in 0 plus 1 dimensions, in some sense, in the bosonic case. And I haven't told you about the fermionic case. Uh, so what happens if you have fermions? And again, Max already told you about it in detail. And that's the Kitaev chain. And uh, so let me just quickly remind you the fermionic case. But from a continuous perspective. So let's start already from the two-dimensional perspective. So you have 0 plus 1d wall, and you have 1 plus 1d bulk, and you have a massive Majorana fermion in the bulk, but with positive mass on one side and negative mass on the other side. And you learned last week that there's a single Majorana fermion here. Right? Single Majorana fermion here. And uh, again, I already discussed this situation many times in various spatial dimensionality. So Presumably, you are tired of listening to the same thing again and again. <laughs> but I'm going to do it <laughs> So in order to put this into standard perspective, you put this negative mass side on the other side. So you just have a system on this side. But now the partition function is the ratio with m very big and m very small. And uh, again, this is equal to something called the eta invariant. And uh, in this particular case, in this particular case, there was a special nice cancellation. I, I think Max told you about it. But th so in general, you need to sum over the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, these eigenvalues, and you need to sum over signs. 
some of the signs, but some of the signs, but because of the fact that the Dirac operator Dirac operator anti-commutes with gamma 0, gamma 1, which is the analog of gamma 5 in four dimensions, I mean anti-commutes. This means that E and minus E, if they are non-zero, come in pairs. Therefore, this regularized sum drastically simplifies because all non-zero contribution just cancels out. So, so this means that 2 pi i eta just receives contributions from the zero modes. And it turns out that this becomes minus 1 to the index of the chiral Dirac operator. Operator. And uh, people differ in opinion whether you call this part the Earth invariant or the exponential version as the Earth invariant. But in any case, this is a Z2 invariant. And this is called the Earth, Earth invariant. And you learn that uh, on the torus, you have four spin structures. I mean, NS, R, NS, 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 R, uh, R, NS, R, R. And it's very easy to see that you don't have any zero modes for the three cases because they are antiperiodic. And when both are periodic, you have one zero modes. Therefore, this exponentiated alpha invariant is plus one, plus one, plus one, and minus one, right? So that's the, uh, that's the value. So what's the significance in string theory? Well, this was pointed out in a paper by Nati Zeiberg and Edward Witten from 1986 uh, with the title Spin Structures in String Theory, if I remember correctly. So uh, again, the topic com comes back to the discussion between the relation uh, of the relation between NSR strings and the physical, physical string spectrum, physical string. And you need to perform something called GSO projection, right? And this GSO projection involves the sum over spin structure. Spin structure. And uh, so very roughly, I mean, that twiddle, which is the sum over uh, spin structures. on the torus of the NSNS, and you need to sum over them, right? Various spin structures. So you have one choice, but we just learned that there is this very important, rather trivial theory in two dimensions. And this is an analog of discrete torsion in the Fermionic case. So you can either not, you, you, you can choose not to include that factor, but you can also include that factor when you perform the spin structure sum. Uh, right. So you do this, and uh, you include this minus 1 to the index d factor or maybe half invariant itself, 
So you can, there are two choices, right? What are these two choices? So these two choices are known as, these two choices correspond to a subtle difference between type A projection and type B projections. If you perform spin sums for both, the left movers and the right movers, they correspond to the difference between the type 2A and type 2B. So you, you now understand where that subtle difference in the phases come from. Um, yeah. Another thing I can mention in the remaining three minutes is the following. So you, you learn that if you perform T-duality along one direction, type A is converted to type B, and if you do that twice, it comes back to itself, right? How do you see that from this point of view? That can be easily seen by going back to the definition of this RF invariant. So this, this eventually became the RF index, the RF invariant, right? Um, so the 2D free fermion system is in fact simple enough that this equality holds without taking the infinite M limit. I mean, it, it, it just so happens that this is, this holds. Um, so I'm sorry for overwriting over the <laughs> previous blackboard. Um, this is something you cannot do on a traditional notebook. If you have a tablet, I think you can copy the previous equation and uh, overwrite it. But uh, so let, let me let me write it again. So another way of writing it is that fermion partition function at value m minus m is related to the fermion function, partition function at plus m, times this half invariant. My, I mean, my, my notation isn't very consistent, but this is what you have. And uh, this is even true, still true, still true when m is 0. Right? So f e this is true even for massless fields. Um, you might wonder, how can it be true? I mean, both sides are the same, and you have minus 1 when the alpha invariant is non-trivial. It, it just means that for massless case, I mean, if you have fermion 0 mode, I mean, the partition function without the insertion of the fermion 0 mode, it's just 0, so it's consistent. But the point is, if you, so this means that if you flip if you flip M, you get, you get off, right? But uh, you need to remember that the T-duality in CFT is a reflection of just the left mover, right? So in the bosonic case, if you have a compactified boson, T-duality is in some sense come from I'm separating the single boson into the left mover and the right mover and just reflecting the left mover. So you need to do that in a supersymmetric way. Therefore, in the supersymmetric uh, T duality, you have X and associated Majorana fermion X in the left moving side and on the right moving side. And in the T duality, you need to perform the flip of the fermion too, right? Therefore, when you perform T duality in superstring theory, what happens is that in the process you need to flip one Majorana fermion, and uh, that corresponds to this flip of the mass term. Ah, so I, I think I forgot to say one thing. I mean, the mass term is very roughly of this form, right? So if you just flip one side, you flip the mass term. Therefore, uh, you generate this term. This means that um, if this spin sum corresponds to the type A GSO projection, then if you perform the T-duality, just by performing the T-duality, you generate this additional phase factor of the alpha invariant, and that becomes the type 2B uh, GSO projection. So that's how the T-duality is related 
and generates are the difference between type A and type B GSO projection. So uh, that's about it for today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>